Do you assist a senior leader? Do you serve in some form of secondary leadership? Do you desire to put your gifts and talents to use that would make great impact? Have you felt resistance in doing so? Have you felt insecure while trying to execute your gifts? If your answer is yes to any of these questions, then this book is definitely for you. The Joshua Syndrome is filled with a wealth of life-changing nuggets that provide insight, encouragement, and tools to all secondary leaders. In addition to strengthening and empowering secondary leaders, it also serves as an aid to senior leaders in supporting those who work alongside them. The Joshua Syndrome is a quick read with a <clears throat> lasting indentation. Get your copy today of The Joshua Syndrome. Navigating the Rough Terrain of Secondary Leadership by Bishop Dr. Carl D. Powell. Praise the Lord. God bless you. Great day to you. Pray that your day has been well, that you have enjoyed yourself thus far, that God has favored you and kept you and protected you all day long, that uh, every device of Satan has been turned around and you have walked in all that God has endeavored for you to walk into. We thank you so very much for taking time out of your busy schedule to be with us on this evening. We are back virtual again uh, for this week only uh, um, for our midweek service due to the fact of us having the flooding that took place on this uh, past Sunday. We walked in Sunday morning and a uh, water was seeping through out the building and you can see how heavy the water was. It was uh, up so high that you could actually see your reflection in it as you move throughout it. Uh, it was all in my office, in the admin's office, in the first classroom, in the bathrooms. Um, it was in the cafe. Uh, it even got up to about halfway the sanctuary. Uh, but thanks be to God, we came in and uh, we put the word out that this is what uh, the situation was. And the saints came to the rescue within uh, two hours, all of this water that you see that's uh, presently on the floor now uh, was drawn up off of the carpet. And then over the next two hours or so, uh, the saints uh, made sure that they uh, put forth great effort. They rented uh, shampoos for the carpet and disinfected. And we went in and shampooed the carpet and drew as much water out as we could. We had people to come in to donate uh, various things like fans and um <clears throat> blowers and also the um, air purifying piece where you put it in there, dehumidify, that's what it's called, uh, to pull the moisture out of the air. So we thank God for all of you that thought it not Robert to be of great support to us to do all that it was that you've done to help assist us to get this rectified as soon as possible. We thank you for those of you that sowed seed in uh, the ministry to help us along these um, 
trying times as well. God has been faithful and uh, we're just blessed to have people in our lives uh, like you all. You all make the difference and we appreciate you so very much. You all lifted our arms and you undergirded us. We were a little discouraged because we had some people that have not frequented the ministry in person since before the pandemic that showed up on that Sunday morning. We were not able to minister to them in the capacity that we would have uh, by way of preaching and teaching. But we did get a chance to love on them, hug on them and uh, pray for them and even had a young lady that uh, watches us virtually. And she came with one of the members uh, from Atlanta that comes once a month. Uh, and they came in and we uh, had an opportunity to enjoy Jesus with her as far as just fellowshipping and praying with her and just talking with her, even though she didn't get a chance to experience the experience that we would have had her to experience when she came down. But we appreciate her so very much for coming out. Had other people that were guests of uh, members of the church that were coming out and this is what we walked into, but we appreciate you all for being patient with us, for being kind to us and loving on us throughout this process. And most of all, praying for us. We appreciate you so very much. All of your prayers are solicited and we are so very, very grateful to you all for that. Let us go before the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you now for another day that you've given unto us. We thank you for another opportunity. We pray that you continue to shower down your grace, your mercy, your wisdom, and your insight upon us as we stand before your people tonight or sit before your people tonight to express your mind, your heart, and your will. We pray that you would connect all of us uh, in love and in the bonds of your your grace and your mercy and we'll bless your name now kids forth and forevermore in Jesus' name we pray amen and amen we are grateful to you all again for being online on line tonight we have mr gloria brown we have mother carolyn pyatt uh that's on uh <clears throat> we have uh trying to make sure i don't miss anybody we have sister charlico brown we have brother brian sutton we have dr Teresa wiggins sister crystal brown we have Sister uh, uh, Terry G. Uh, Hudson uh, that's online tonight. I want to make sure that I try to pronounce it Terry G. Uh, Hudson. I make sure I pronounce it correctly. Like I don't want her to choke me. She's probably going to get me for that as well. We have Evangelist Dorothy Brown that's on tonight. Uh, we have uh, Minister Jacqueline Kelly that's on. We appreciate you so much, much for being on as well. Uh, Minister Regina Brown. We have my good thing, Pastor Kamisha Parrott. We have uh, Sister Kamisha Adams that's on. We have Deaconess, Dr. Sonia Cook that's on. We have uh, Brother Tony Boo that's on. We appreciate you, sir. Uh, we have uh, Sister Valerie Foster that's on. Uh, Evangelist Dr. Cynthia Adams that's on. Sister Sarah Paulin that's on. Sister Jamie Law that's on. We have um, Sister Maria Walker that's on. Brother Kent Brown, Minister Kelly Bowman. Uh, we thank God for you all. Shan Quinetta Milton, we thank you so very much. I think that's how you pronounce your name. I don't want to mess it up, uh, but I know exactly who you are. But we appreciate you so very much. Her husband came in uh, to assist us with this whole process, and we appreciate him so very much for uh, rendering his time, his effort, his skill, and his ability to help us to get to um, where it is that we are so far in this process. We have... Um, <laughs> Sister Terry G said, I got it right, I think. <laughs> All right, we have uh, Elder uh, A.C. Davis is on. Uh, Delvin Trail that's on. We thank God for you. We are so uh, very honored to have you all on tonight. We appreciate you so very much. The services would not be what it has been thus far had it not been for your presence and for your support. Uh, we are looking to be back in the sanctuary uh, by Friday so that way we can have the uh, parents night out so our young people will be at the church along with other older young people while the adults will get a chance to hang out and go watch Netflix or go to a movies or go and have dinner, do whatever it is that they do, and then come back and pick up the young people. We try to make sure that we were intentional about ministering to the whole man. So parents night out, make sure that you tell a friend, tell a neighbor, tell an in-law, tell an outlaw, let somebody know what it is that we are offering. We're making sure that we do all that we can to entertain the young people, but at the same time, make sure that they're in an environment where they are ministered to um, by way of the spirit of God and also the character and the integrity of God will be also expressed during that time. So that way they can come closer to God and realize that uh, walking with God is not just a church experience, but it's a life experience. So we're excited about what the Lord is doing concerning that. 
We're also moving into our 21st pastoral and church anniversary. I'm excited about that. Uh, I know that uh, when you look at me, you can tell I've been around a while with all those greatest popping out, no matter how low I cut it and how uh, much I try to hide it, you know, it still tries to uh, pop through. But we are grateful that the Lord has sustained us and kept us uh, this amount of time. So uh, God has blessed us. We have several preachers that are coming in. We have Apostle Nico Brown that will be sharing with us at our 1130 service on February the 26th. On uh, that Tuesday night, February the 28th, we have a good friend, brother of mine, Apostle Kelvin Steele. He'll be sharing then the following Sunday at 1130, it's March the 5th, we have my friend and my brother, Bishop Willie Hayes. He'll be sharing with us at the 1130 service. And then we have evangelist uh, Shantae Williams. She's from uh, Florida. She'll be sharing with us that Tuesday night, uh, March the 7th at 730. Uh, throughout the rest of the month, we'll have various people that will be coming, uh, that will be sharing with us. A lot of those that are ministers here at Rama will be sharing at our 930, at our 1130 services. They'll be sharing powerful words so you don't want to miss them. Uh, they'll bless your life in a great way. If you've never heard the preachers from Rama, you are in for a treat. They are some powerful men and women of God. Uh, a lot of them are gifted in various areas. We have people that have a strong teaching grace. Others have a strong prophetic grace. Others have a uh, strong evangelistic grace, many exalters. So you you would do yourself good to embrace what it is that God is expressing through them. Uh, my wife and I are so godly proud of how they are being lifted up and exalted in the body of Christ and how God is dealing with them and using them. So we, uh, commend them, celebrate them. Also, those of you that have know me, you know Prophet Mosley, and uh, he has been a spiritual father to me, a mentor down through the years, and had the privilege of traveling all over the country with him, um, being, I guess, encouraged by him, rebuked by him, challenged by him uh, in the areas of ministry. And um, what he has said was he is going to be available to come and share with us on the final Saturday in the month of, um, in the, fi the final, excuse me, not Saturday, the final Sunday in the month of March. So the whatever the last Sunday is in March, I want to say the 26th, if I'm not mistaken, he'll be available to share with us on that service for our 1130. So if you are available, you want to be there. He is uh Turn that's right. This it is the twenty sixth. It's going to be a powerful service. Anytime he's with us, God uses him in a mighty way. Uh, I share with people that people look at uh, how he moves in the word of knowledge, calling names and addresses. That's just a part of what he does. He's an evangelist to his heart. He's always concerned about winning souls. Healing is a, a major part of his ministry. Uh, the prophetic gift, uh, him releasing mind and heart of God, letting you know what God's purpose is is a major part of what God has done uh, in his life and through his life, what he's been called to. I tell the testimony oftentimes when I had the opportunity to be with him in Detroit, Michigan, it was a mega church that we were in, thousands of people that were there. And while we were in the church service, uh, the pastor introduced him and told the people, he said, this man of God told me several years ago when he came, how he saw the building. And I looked at him and I had a look on my face like, no, he missed it because what he described was not what the blueprints were. And when they went to get everything started, it was denied. It was rejected because the codes were not falling into place and they had to adjust the blueprints. And by the time they adjusted the blueprints, everything turned out to looking exactly like how Prophet described it. And uh, God used prophet mightily in that service, calling out people and ministering to them. So if, like I said, if you have not been a part of one of his services, you want to be uh, in the service, it'll bless your life in a great way. So we're excited about what the Lord is doing and what the Lord has done thus far. We're going to move forward in uh, to what it is that the Lord is going to be dealing with us concerning. We've been talking about lately dealing with uh, forgiveness, not just talking about forgiveness, talking about repentance. We're dealing with being a friend of God. How does that look? We talked about even on the last time, the more of God and even dealing with the more of God. We're going to have a continuation of that 
on today, whenever you're dealing with the moral God, it's all about us coming into a place to where we're now denying ourselves and making sure that when he sees us, he sees his reflection. It's all about us now coming into a place to where he can recognize that we are the expression of who he is in the earth realm. When you look at Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ was the son of God or is the son of God. Now he tells us in the book of John, he says, now we are the sons of God, but do not yet appear what we shall be. So he's saying what Jesus is and what Jesus was while he was walking on the earth is who we should be and how we should express ourselves while we're walking on the earth. So the same things that we saw him doing, we're supposed to be doing because he's supposed to be the head of the body. He's the one that directs us. We're supposed to submit our will to what it is that he's articulated as he submitted his will to what the father says, because they are one. We're supposed to submit ourselves to become one with him as he's one with the father. We understand that uh, we're not, quote unquote, the triune of the father, son, Holy Spirit, but we are created from. You understand we are the offspring of the triune God. The, the fullness of God, the manifestation of the fullness of the God here bodily being Jesus Christ. We are an expression of that. So that's why we say we are the body of Christ. You understand? Does this make sense to you? He's letting us know what you've seen Jesus demonstrate is what I'm looking for you now to demonstrate. Love, forgive, allow the, the kingdom of God to be established through you. Allow, you know, the children to come under him. So we're supposed to be making sure that we were intentional about winning young people, not just focusing on the older. Our, our, our whole thing is making sure that the generation to come is um, prepared for what is next. I was looking at a live and one of my friends from um, Lee County, she was up sharing her live and she was talking about we have to be very intentional about targeting our young people because if we're not careful when it's time for us to pass the baton for them to lead the way, they're going to be ill prepared. And too often we find ourselves being so focused on what's going on with us until we're not doing what it is that we're called to and we're assigned to. And our assignment is to advance the body of Christ. Uh, and sometimes it's easy to forget about what, the, our, what our assignment is, trying to make sure that we do what makes us feel good or look good at the moment. Uh, so all of these are things that we want to make sure that we take into consideration as we're moving forward in this season, talking about the more of God. Now, I want you, if you have your Bibles, look with me quickly. We're going to start out quickly at, in the Old Testament. We'll look at the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 29. Many of you know this text of scripture. So we're going to start there uh, simply because many of you know it already. And then we're going to move forward. Jeremiah 29. We're going to start at verse number 11, and we're going to move through verse number 14. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse number 11, and we're going to move through verse number 14. It says, for I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Then shall you call upon me, and you shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you, and ye shall seek me and find me. Ye shall search for me with all your heart, and I will be found of you, saith the Lord, and I will turn away your captivity, and I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places where I have driven you, saith the Lord, and I will bring you again into a place whence I shall cause you to be carried away captive. God says, I need you to call on me. If you call on me, then regardless to what I've allowed to happen or what I have caused to happen, I'm going to reverse it. I'm going to bring you back unto myself. Um, we're at a time now where we're celebrating today, Valentine's Day. So, so often uh, you have people that are in relationships and while they're in, in relationships, they might get upset with each other. They might find themselves falling out. But usually there's some event, there's something that comes around to remind them of the love that they have towards one another. And they put forth special effort to try to repair relationships. I'm not talking about how young people used to be when they were in school because they didn't want to buy uh, their special person a gift so they'll break up with them right before Valentine's Day. But I'm talking about those that are, are in season relationships that they might have had some issues or whatnot going on. So these times bring about, you know, let's rekindle what was lost. Or you have a 
some kind of event that would come up, a birthday or some holiday that would come around that would cause people to rekindle. God says, you don't have to wait for an event. Just call on me. I'm willing to start the process of restoring right now. I'm willing to make that happen right now. Call on me. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to reverse what had already taken place. All of these are things we're looking at. He says, you know, the thoughts that I have towards you are thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected. I don't want the worst for you. You remember if you watched um, the reel that I did just uh, recently talking about rejection, dealing with the fact that every rejection is not, um, I don't want to deal with you. Some rejections are, I want to deal with you, but I refuse to deal with you unless there's something changed in how we interact with one another. Because if something doesn't change with how we interact with one another, we won't be able to have a long lasting relationship because I can't deal with you like this. You won't be able to deal with me like this. Is this making sense? When God is dealing with us, that's all he's saying. He says, I want a relationship with you. That's what he told Cain. But don't bring me garbage. Don't bring to me what is not fit for who I am. Bring me what I deserve. Bring me what honors me. Go get a suitable gift. Does this make sense to you? Talking about the more of God. This is where we're moving at. Uh, look with me quickly at the book of Proverbs. Proverbs, and we're going to look at verse number eight, uh, chapter eight. Proverbs chapter eight, and we're going to look at verse 17. Proverbs eight and verse number 17. Are you there? The scripture says, I love them that love me, and those that seek me early shall find me. The scripture says, I love them that love me, and those that seek me early shall find me. Um, God is letting us know. He says, you love me. I just want you to know you don't love me without me loving you. He says, but if you really want to find me, he says, seek me early. Make me a priority. Early in the morning shall I seek thee, O Lord. I think one of the psalmists uh, made that declaration. When you seek God, you make him priority. Then he's wanting to be found. He just wants to make sure that you're postured properly when you're seeking after him. Um, there are a lot of people that are seeking um, to know more about their purpose of their life. And sometimes they'll try to circumvent God himself to get these answers. So they'll seek out psychics. They'll seek out mediums. They'll uh, deal with all of these other ways of trying to tap into the realm of the spirit rather than going through the person of Jesus Christ. What are you trying to say? When you tap into the person of Jesus Christ, he'll navigate you by way of the Holy Spirit through the realm of the spirit. So that way you won't find yourself getting caught up with things that are not of God. Whenever you leave out of this first realm of heaven, you understand? Once you jump into this, the, the air off the ground, you're in the first realm of heaven up into the sky. When you get into outer space, that's the second realm of heaven. That's the demonic realm where the enemy is warring and fighting there. So you need a guide to get you through there, the guide of the Holy Spirit to make you get to the third heaven where the presence of God is, where you can get the direction and the answers that you need. The second heaven, that's where the princes of the air rest, princes over certain regions. That's where they rest. And they try to hinder your prayers from getting to God, while at the same time try to hinder the blessings and the directions of God from getting down to you. There's a war that's going on there. So you want to navigate that realm to get into the heaven is to hear what God has to say and come back through. You want to create a space over your life, a portal, like would like to call it, to where God could allow the angels to flow from heaven down to you, your prayers back up to God. All of these are things that God's looking for you to tap into. You need to tap into that. I, I want you, I'm seeking you early before the demonic attacks really start uh, taking place, you know, throughout the day. We, we dealt with between the hours of 2 uh, a.m. and 5 a.m. That's when you have major warfare. Uh, that's, that's when the enemy is really trying to attack you to the greatest degree. Usually that's when people are in the realm sleep. They're in that heavy sleep, you know, between the hours of 2 and 5, you know, because you've already been resting a while. You, you're getting ready to, to head to that place of waking up shortly. So it, that's the heaviest time of sleep. And that's where the enemy is fighting you the most because you're you're suspended between consciousness and unconsciousness. You're, you're asleep. You, you understand you're 
in that that deep spot where they can really infiltrate and impart things into your mind. So these are things you want to think about while we're um, moving forward as far as getting closer to God. There's something that um, uh, I do, my wife and I, we do from time to time. We might watch television while we're going to, uh, while we're laying down before we go to sleep after we uh, have shared and talked about what has happened throughout the day. And in that, I have to make sure I set the, the sleeper on it. So if I fall asleep, the television won't stay on all night ministering to me in my subconscious, ministering to her in her subconscious. Is, is this making sense to you? Because I want to have to guard those gates, making sure that we're protected as we go through, making sure that everything that we hear is uh, not a commercial that's coming on, is feeding us with some kind of uh, idea, concept, or something else that comes on the television that we were not anticipating to watch that uh, ministered to us while we were asleep. All of these are things we want to make sure that we're preparing ourselves to get the more of God, making sure that you're feeding yourself with all that it is that you have need of to move into the next realm. Um, let's go to another Old Testament scripture before we really dive into where we're going. We're going to look at Zephaniah. Many people have not really tapped into this book, but we're going to look at Zephaniah. Zephaniah chapter two and verse number three. Zephaniah chapter two. And verse number three, let's start at verse number one. It says, gather yourselves together. Yea, gather together, O nation, not desire. Before the decree, bring forth, before the day, pass as a chaff. Before the fierce anger of the Lord come upon you, before the day of the Lord's anger come unto me. So he starts out by saying, gather yourselves together, come to God before all of the trials and the tribulations come. Usually in our lives, one of the things that we do is we find ourselves waiting until major issues come up in our lives before we start seeking after God. But he tells us, he says, gather yourselves together and come unto me. Come and seek my face before the issues start to arise. If you find yourself coming unto me before the issues arise, then when the issues arise, you won't be overwhelmed. You won't be overcome with what's happening to you. I talked to you all, I think, some time ago, talking about how you have to brace yourself. And sometimes the Holy Spirit will put you in a prayerful mode. He'll put you in a time of worship, a time of really studying his word. And it leads up to something traumatic that's getting ready to happen. And the reason he's doing that is because he's bracing you. He's fortifying you for you to be protected against all of the wiles of the enemy and all the issues that are about to come your way. He wants to make sure that none of these things hinder you from fulfilling the mandate that God has on your life. He wants to make sure that you don't fall, you don't um, waver when these things arise. You're able to stand and stand strong, stand firm, being able to endure hardness as a good soldier when it arises. The Bible lets us know that as believer, you, as believers, rather, we're going to deal with hardship. We're going to deal with trials. We're going to deal with tribulations. We are not exempt because we're believers. But what happens is we have hope that Christ in us is going to lift up a standard against every one of the attacks that the enemy brings our way. So these things are times of preparation. It's preparing us to be able to handle what is to come. So don't take the times and the seasons that you're going through um, of rejoicing as, okay, this is how it's always going to be. Life is filled with ups and downs. You have reward, you have struggle. All of this is a part of our development in God. God wants us to grow mature and uh, develop in him. Look with me at uh, Malachi. Malachi chapter, let's look at chapter number three, verse number one, and then we're going to run to chapter four and verse number six. Malachi chapter three, verse number one, and then we're going to look at um, Malachi chapter four and verse number six. Are you there? Chapter three, verse number one. And then we're going to look at chapter four, verse number six. It says, behold, I will send my messenger and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple. Even the messenger of the covenant whom ye delight in Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. So God's letting us know whenever I'm preparing you for the next, what I'm going to do is I'm going to send you a messenger. I'm going to prove it to you. When God was getting ready to start something great in the earth, he always started using an individual. 
when he wanted to bring his people out of bondage. Who did he use? He used a guy by the name of Moses. Whenever he wanted to uh, bring a people out of uh, paganism, he used a guy by the name of Abram. Whenever he wanted to bring his people and redeem them from sin, he used a person. He used the person of Jesus Christ. What are you trying to say? God always uses an individual to bring us from where we are to where he wants us to be. And he says, that's what I'm doing. I'm sending a message in your way so that way I can pull you out of where you are and point you in the direction that you're in. Now, all of this is setting the stage for where we're getting ready to go because the job of the enemy is to cause us to have issues in relationships. You understand? Because if he can cause us to see God not right, if we don't see God properly and we don't see each other properly, then we're hindered in order to get the message that God wants to get to us. We're not able to hear the clarion call of God that's flowing through that individual that he brings into our lives or even by way of the spirit of God, because we're upset with God. We're mad with God. We feel as though God done us wrong because of what has happened in our lives for whatever reason. Look with me now at Malachi chapter four, and we're going to look at verse number six chapter four and verse number six. He goes on to tell us, he says, and he shall turn the hearts of the father to the children and the children, excuse me, the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. He closes out this whole chapter in Malachi, closes out the book of Malachi with this last verse, says it's necessary that the hearts of the father be turned back towards the children and the hearts of the children be turned back towards the father. Because if this does not happen, the earth is going to be smited with a curse. There's so much division that's happening in the earth realm. And it's simply because the enemy does not want us to get the more of God. He realizes if I can cause there to be division between people and other individuals, if I can call there to be division between people and God, then I can cause there to be a major issue where they'll never be able to get what it is that they have need of. God will have to honor his word and smite the earth with a curse. So now you have children that are arguing with parents, parents that are arguing with children. You have people that are not in good relationship standings whatsoever. So even while we're in this month of love, while we're celebrating the day of Valentine's Day, make sure that you're very intentional, like we were saying before, extending love towards other individuals, making sure that you are intentional about forgiving, operating in a posture of saying, you know, life is too short for me to carry grudges and uh, for me to have all of these pent up uh, issues going on. You know, I'm going to love you and we're going to keep moving. You understand? And based off of, you know, what we decide to do, how that looks, it's going to be how it looks, but you're not going to stop me from loving you and you're not going to stop me from being there for you. You know, our, our relationship might change if our our postures can't work together, but we're going to still love each other and there's nothing the enemy can do about it. We're still going to be for there for each other and there's nothing the enemy uh, can do about it. So all of these are things that we want to be intentional about. Don't allow anything that the enemy does to cause you to I guess, not experience God's best. You understand? Just like you need forgiveness, the people that have done you wrong need forgiveness too. You understand? Just like you've done uh, a bad deal to others, others, you know, have done bad deals to you. You know, so you have to be one that don't just expect forgiveness, but forgive, uh, but also give forgiveness. And it's easier to expect forgiveness than it is to give it. Because while you're saying, you know, I'm on this side of supposed to be forgiving the other individual, I'm still traumatized by what they did to me. I'm still remembering everything that happened to me. You know, sometimes we are held hostage because they never told us that they were sorry. They never told us they apologized. And I told you all that that evens the scales in relationships. You're telling people I'm sorry or I apologize and thank you. Because that person that you're dealing with, they realize when you say, I apologize, or I'm sorry, that you recognize that you did them wrong and that you're trying to do what you can to mend that relationship. When you say thank you, what you're saying is on my side, I recognize that you offered me something that I can't repay myself. So the least that I can do is let you know I appreciate what it was that you've done for me. It balances the scales. Is this making sense to you? All right. Um, while, while we're there, I, I guess I'll run to the scripture. Let's look at Proverbs. Proverbs uh, chapter number 11. Proverbs chapter 11. 
since we're there, Proverbs chapter 11, and we'll look at verse number one. The scripture says, a false balance is an abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. A false balance is an abomination unto the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. Sometimes we find ourselves being um, extremists. We're too far left or we're too far right, but we struggle with being right there in the center. When we deal with this whole piece of uh, what is an abomination? Well, when you deal with an abomination, I was asking God, give me a simple way to define this whole piece. We understand it's something that you hate. It's something that you don't like. But why? Give me some insight concerning it. And I believe that he spoke very clearly to my heart. And he says, it hinders my ability to be productive through my people. So all of the things that he considered to be an abomination, he hates it because it hinders his ability to be productive through his people. So that means what he's placed in us to produce is hindered by way of us doing what he told us not to do. That's why he told us that uh, we should not sow discard against the brethren because it hinders his ability for us to be productive. We can't expand the body if we're fighting. You know, a house divided against itself can't stand. So that's why the enemy loves to create division between individuals because he hinders the productivity of what God wants to do. You understand? When you eat certain things uh, physically, it hinders your body. So even if it doesn't hinder you immediately, it might cause health issues down the line. It hinders your ability to be productive. You, you see where I'm coming from? So that's the main issue. It's not because God's trying to keep something from you. It's that God is saying, I want the best for you. But what you're doing is you're hindering yourself from getting my best by doing these things I told you not to do. Is, is it making sense to you? you? You can't get what I desire for you to get because you're not doing it my way. All right. Look with me quickly at um, First Chronicles. Let's look at First Chronicles and we'll look at chapter 16. First Chronicles chapter 16, and we'll look at verse number 11. First Chronicles 16 and verse number 11. Are you there? Still yet talking about the more of God. That's what we want. We want to get closer to God. We want the more of God. We want that experience in our lives um, that we have not had um, most recently. Sometimes whenever you get into a relationship, the relationship might get stale because you, you lose your, your seeker, your hunt. Uh, after that individual. Uh, I posted a picture not long ago showing when my wife was uh, trying to kiss me and I put on this, she always want to kiss my mouth. And uh, people, you know, they started laughing, thought it was so funny. And uh, she got the message from someone screenshot to her. She said, what is this? I want to kiss your mouth. I said, you always want to kiss my mouth. You know, I have to fight you all. And she said, all of this stuff you put on Facebook, I'm not on Facebook like that. I don't even know what's going on. I said, I can't even want to kiss my mouth. But uh, all of this is just trying to make sure that you're doing what's necessary to keep relationship alive, keep fire in there. Even if it's not a relationship between a husband and a wife, it's a relationship between friends. What are you doing to keep that relationship sharp? Have you texted them lately? Have you called them lately? Have you spent time and say, hey, let's, let's just go and grab a bite to eat? Have you just, I'm guess, made sure that they were they were good? Just swung by the house or something. I just want to look at you. Just make sure you're all right. We're in this hour where so much is happening. I just want to make sure my people's all right. You wouldn't say, I understand grammatically that's not correct for you English teachers. But I, I just want to make sure that, you know, everybody's on the up and up. That we're healthy. We're, we're whole. And we're in a good space because life happens. And when life happens, sometimes you can be so engulfed with what you have going on until you miss the signs of what's going on in the life of other people. And as believers, we don't want to miss the signs of what's happening in the lives of other people right around us. We don't want people to be in a place of misery and suffering right in our presence. And we don't pick it up. We don't discern it. You know, even if we don't discern it, we want to at least detect it because I've seen you. You know, because sometimes you can get so caught up with what you have going on until your your spiritual man is not as sharp as it should be. But if at least you're in their presence, you can detect it. 
you know, they're not smiling like they, they used to or something different about that smile. And it's not spiritually discerned, but it's naturally detected. You understand? So we want to make sure that we're thinking about these things, especially in this season that we're in. I believe that even though um, this holiday has nothing to do with spirituality, I believe that we can make the best out of everything that we have that God has given unto us. So if you're going to celebrate it, you know, don't worry about all of the um, things that are promoted just to grab your economics, uh, I guess to promote economics rather than to grab your income, but make sure that you're thinking about people. People are important. If, 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 you, if you would be so kind for me as we get ready to move into this next scripture, just put down that people are important. As we prepare to go to First Chronicles 16, this type in the chat said people are important. I understand that, you know, everything else seems to be popular, but just let somebody know people are important. I'm concerned about people. People are important. You understand? You know, there, there are people right now that are struggling because they don't feel like they're loved. They don't feel like they're appreciated. They don't feel like they're important. And sometimes they just need to know that somebody believes that they're important. You know, there's something about you that is is a great asset to somebody else. There's something about you that's a great asset to the body of Christ. The world is a better place because you're here. You understand? That, that's what it's all about. People are important. If it wasn't for people, you would be in a bind right now. Because every day there are people that make happen uh, what needs to happen so that way you can experience what is it you're experiencing? You know, somebody uh, shipped gas to the gas station so you can put gas in your car. Somebody's working at the gas station so you can purchase the gas and you can buy whatever it is that you need out of the store. Somebody is uh, doing whatever is necessary so that way you can move up and down the, the roadways. And there's somebody that created, uh, that came up with the idea, the concept of the business or the company that you're working for so that way you can be employed. Somebody did this that God used so that way it can be a benefit to your life. People are important. Look with me at First Chronicles. First Chronicles chapter 16 and verse number 11. Are you there? It says, seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face continually. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face continually. Too often we want to seek the hand of God, but we don't want to seek the face of God. When we seek the face of God, we find ourselves getting all that God wants for us to have. He says, seek the Lord and his strength. Seek the Lord continuously. We want to make sure that we're doing what it is that God wants for us to do. We're tapping into the power the mind, the heart of God, not just the provision of God. We want to tap into the mind, the heart, the power of God, not just the provision of God. The provision of God will come once we find out what the will of God is for our lives, as we seek his face, we're tapping into his mind, his heart and his power. Ultimately, he gives us the provision. He tells us, seek ye first the kingdom of God and all of his righteousness and all of these other things will be added unto us. There's certain things we shouldn't have to pray for if we just seek the face of God. If we seek the face of God, then God will reveal to us our purpose He'll reveal to us what our assignment is. And then it's right in the midst of that, that everything else will begin to come. It'll begin to manifest. It'll come right to where we are. This is making sense to you. All right. Very familiar passage of scripture. Uh, first, assume, excuse me, second Chronicles. Second Chronicles, chapter number seven and verse number 14. You all probably know it already. Second Chronicles, chapter seven and verse number 14. If my people who are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. He said, then shall I hear from heaven, forgive their sin and heal the land. God's moving us into a place where he's looking for us to seek him. That's what the moral God is all about. What is God requiring of me? He's requiring for me to seek him. Now, I said something earlier talking about the false balance. Now, we talked about being an extremist. I'm one way here, I'm the other way on the other side. When you are operating in what I would call a balanced life, you're spiritual, but you realize you're living in a natural world, a world. So because you're a spiritual being living in a natural world, 
you have to be able to operate both spiritually and naturally. So that means I can't just be all about just praying, 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 praying. But after I prayed, I have to be about doing, 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 doing. It's just making sense. So it's not just pray only. It's not just do only. It's pray and do. You understand? That means after I pray, there's something that I need to do. So I can pray, oh God, bless my friend, bless my neighbor. But what am I doing to make sure that they're in that place of being blessed? He might speak to you in the midst of you praying and say, just go and show them your face. This, this being their presence. You might say, just ask them to, to go and hang out. You never can tell. After you pray, you got to do. Don't, don't just be over here. I'm, I'm spiritual and have a false balance. But after you pray, go and do. What did he say while you in prayer? Because you know prayer is a dialogue, right? That means you don't just talk to God only. After you talk to him, he listens, hear your concerns, and then he comes back and speaks to you. So now he props your heart. He moves upon you. He articulates what his will is for you to do after you've talked to him. All of this is about the more of God. This is what he wants. I'm wanting more for you. There, there are times in relationships where you might be praying, God, this person did this, and I feel like that person did that. And then God reveals to you how you handled the situation, how you responded in the situation. And instead of him telling that person to do something, he tells you to do something. And you saying to yourself, God, that's not fair. I feel like they should be coming to me. But he says, I'm not worried about them coming to you right now. I'm worried about you going to them. Leave your gift at the altar and go to them. I'm helping you. That, that's what praying and doing is. Not just one or the other. It's both and. This is making sense to you. The more of God. Now, it's getting ready to get real good because my time is, is drawing nigh. We're going to look at uh, some scripture in the New Testament. Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. Are you there? Acts chapter 17. And we're going to look at verses 24 through 28. Acts chapter 17, verses 24 through 28. It says, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is the Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshiped with men's hands, as though he needed anything seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things and have made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth and they have determined the time before appointed and the bonds, excuse me, and the bounds of their habitations. Verse 27, that they should seek the Lord if happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us, for in him we live, we move, and have our being as certain also of our own poets have said, for we have also his offspring. Look at this whole text of scripture. He tells us, he says, God doesn't need for us to worship him. He didn't even have to dwell in buildings that we made ourselves, but he was basically going on and telling us, he says that God created all of these things. And because God created all these things, he created the habitations and the boundaries that we have. He says, but he wants us to do what? Seek him. He says, and if we seek him, then we'll find him. It's in him that we live, we move, and we have our being. We've dealt with the whole piece dealing with the Feast of Tabernacle. And talking about the Feast of Tabernacle, one of the things we dealt with was when God created the Tabernacle himself. Itself. The reason he created the Tabernacle himself was we were trying to get to God. God says, I understand you're trying to get to me, and that's good. He said, but you can't get to me without me coming to you. So I'm going to create the tabernacle so that I can come and dwell with man. And then he tells us, he says, this tabernacle that we've constructed with our hands, even though it had fine uh, gold on it, it was made of some of the uh, most extravagant material. He gave them specific instructions of how to construct it. 
He told us, he says, our body was going to be the dwelling place of the tabernacle in which his Holy Spirit dwell. He says, so I don't want to just dwell in the building. I want to dwell in this building. So when you come to the building and you assemble yourselves, you gather yourselves, you're bringing me with you. Not just coming there to find me. You've already created a relationship with me. So you're bringing the relationship you have with me to a corporate gathering and everybody's enjoying who I am while they're expressing their relationship one with another. Is this making sense to you? So now you get to experience a part of my relationship as I worship. I get a chance to experience a part of your relationship as you worship. Our worship experience is heightened because all of us are bringing the portion of God that we have together and God is being glorified in the earth realm. I'm talking about the more of God. That There's a space that we can experience God in that's, um, that's different and unique. When I say different and unique, when we get together, that means I can reach God by myself and I can spend time with God by myself. But when I get with other believers that can reach God by themselves and we all start reaching God together, there is a presence of God that comes in that's different from what I experience by myself. It can be thicker than what I can experience by myself. If we were all in one place with one accord, there's, there's a, a greater surge of faith that can be released when we're worshiping it together that I can't necessarily get while I'm by myself. Is this making sense to you? So all of this is, is what God wants for us. He wants us to have personal relationship, but he also wants us to make sure that we bring this relationship and worship with one another, connect with one another, not just in the worship experience, but even outside the worship experience. The thing that was, um, I said, I guess brought so much joy to my, to my heart was even while we were cleaning up during the flood, the people still had joy. They were rejoicing. It was like, whatever I can do. The young lady that came uh, with Minister Sheree from Georgia, she was like, I wish I had some clothes I could change it to. I could help you. I'm like, no, I don't want you. You came in for the worship experience. She's like, but I, I want to help too. She she saw everybody else pitching in and she wanted to be a part of what was going on. She's like, what can I do? How can I help? How can I assist? And this is this is what God's doing. He's helping us to see that I've pl placed people in your life. You don't even realize how much love they have towards you. You don't even realize the heart that they have towards you. So you can't be in the season of feeling like you're by yourself and you're all alone and that nobody cares. You have more people that love you than you know. You have more people that are supporting you and that's backing you than you know. You have people that are going to do things for you that you have no idea of as of yet. I, I prophesy right now that there's some of you that are watching by way of live. Your name is already talked about. Your name is already flowing and moving in different circles and people are already discussing what they're going to do for you and when they're going to do it for you and how it's going to happen. People are already trying to figure out when is the time going to be right for them to introduce you to this next season of your life and for this next platform and to uh, this next position. It's all about you making sure that you stay in the right posture so that when that opportunity presents itself, you don't allow how you feel and what's going on with you emotionally to cause you to miss out on what God's getting ready to bring you away. Because whenever God brings opportunity, the enemy always gets in and try to cause disturbances to happen because he wants you out of the right standing so that when the opportunity presents itself, they look at you and say, perhaps I was getting ready to make a mistake. So they go to draw back because you're not demonstrating the character that's indicative of what you should be uh, presenting for where you're getting ready to go. Some of you getting ready to walk into some greatness. Just make sure that you don't allow what happens around you to disturb you to the point to where you mess up the opportunity that's coming. Just, 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 just type in the chat. It's the opportunity is on the, on the way. Opportunity is on the way. Opportunity is on the way. We're almost at an end tonight. We have about two more scriptures and I'm going to let you go. We're going to run to the book of James, James chapter four and verse number eight, James chapter four and verse number eight. It says, draw nigh to God and he'll draw nigh unto you. Cleanse your hands, you, uh, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. So he says, draw nigh unto him. So he's, he's talking to all of us that may have drawn back from God and have 
done things that we were not, uh, we should not have been doing. He says, I don't want you to stay in that state. You remember I told you what rejection was all about? It's not all about throwing you away. Opportunity is coming. He says, just cleanse your hands, repent, because I want you to draw nigh unto me. That's what he's doing. He's creating opportunity. He says, get it together because I'm drawing you closer. Get it together because I'm bringing you into my space. Get it together because some major things are about to happen for you. Is this making sense to you? Last scripture and we're closing. Matthew chapter number 13. Matthew chapter 13. And we're going to look at verses 44 through 40, uh, 46. Matthew chapter 13, verses 44 through 46. You've got to make sure we get it together because opportunity is on the way. Make sure that you get it together because the opportunity is on the way. He's drawing you closer, but you can't get closer if you allow the issues that you've been dealing with in times past to keep pushing him away. All right. Uh, Matthew 13, verses 44 through 46. Are you there? All right. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hidden in a field, the which when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man, seeking goodly pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Whenever you're thinking about receiving the more of God, you have to see it as something of great price. Being in the presence of God, receiving the more of God is so important to me until there's certain things I'm willing to sacrifice. I'm willing to sacrifice how I feel at the moment, even though I might be upset because I felt like God didn't look out for me when I thought he should have that God allows certain things to happen to me that I didn't think should have happened to me when um, he's prompting me to do something as it pertains to assisting or, or helping somebody that might not have necessarily been uh, my cup of tea in times past or not done me uh, the best deal in times past. I don't allow how I feel to hinder me from responding. I realize that the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven is of great price. And if I really want to draw nigh unto God and I want all that God has for me and I want to tap into all that God wants me to tap into, I'm going to get beyond myself and I'm going to move into that season. We're talking about making sure that we get the more of God. Sometimes when we get in the more of God, we've got to say, hey, what I've dealt with is not worth me missing out on what comes along with uh, me submitting to the little God. Some of you have gone through so much over the last several years and what you've gone through has put you in a place to where your heart has become somewhat calloused. It's not totally hardened, but you're at a place to where you are so protected until you're not going to allow yourself to feel anything. It's almost like you're in a season of being numb. You're saying, I don't want to love too much because love hurts too much. You understand? Because if I find out that the person don't embrace me like I embrace them, I don't know how I would, be able to handle this. But I believe that God's moving you into a season to where you're going to be able to open up again and say, even if I have to hurt on this side, I realize there's enough joy on the other side to bring me through the process. I'm willing to go through the disappointment on this side to come out on the other side rejoicing. I won't allow what has happened to me to traumatize me to the point to where I don't experience the more of God. I believe that God's got great things for you and healing is on the horizon for you. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you now for these, your people that are under the sound of my voice. They're gathered together here on this night, and I pray that you would bring about healing and restoration their way. I come against every attack that the enemy has launched against their hearts, whether it's concerning you, whether it's concerning other individuals, 
whether they're even traumatized by something that happened to them in their times past. I pray, God, that you would restore their joy, restore the love that they have towards you, their love that they have towards other individuals. Help them to get to a place of trusting again. But even while they're trusting, help them to be wise in their trusting, where they're not just going into a situation blindly, but they'll find themselves moving into it as you would teach us to move. They'll begin to relate to the individual back and forth. That way they'll be able to see what it is that that individual is capable of doing. And they'll know what space to allow that individual to occupy in their lives. I pray that you would begin to reward them because of their commitment to move beyond what they've suffered into what you promised. And Father, we give your name glory, honor, and praise for it. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen and amen. Well, I pray that something was said on tonight that have encouraged your heart, that has blessed you. We uh, are excited about what the Lord is doing and what the Lord has done. Make sure that you continue to put the word out that uh, on Friday evening, we still will be having uh, parents night out. So all the young people will be coming out when we have a, the younger, uh, the older young people that will be there managing them and enjoy, helping them enjoy Jesus and uh, giving them a good Christian experience. Uh, away from the parents. And then on Sunday morning, we'll be back into the sanctuary, uh, both 930 and 1130 services, uh, having a high time in Jesus. I believe there's going to be a powerful word. I know that God is going to move in a mighty way because the enemy would not have tried to do what he has done had God not had a plan in store for blessing his people. So make sure that you're in uh, the place and prepared for what it is that God's doing. Be praying for us if you can't be there physically, but if you're there by way of the worship experience uh, virtually, make sure that you let us know that you're there, that uh, God is moving by his power and you're experiencing over the virtual experience, what we're experiencing right there in the live uh, service. Well, until next time, blessings and favor be your portion.